Again, just some more information to make this point about how important it is in the context of science. Uh, this is a study done by two researchers about the communication patterns of engineers and scientists. And what did they find? That some engineers and scientists spend 25% of their time reading, okay? which is quite a significant amount of time. And that if you add in the amount of time they spend speaking and writing, it becomes 58%. And that sort of changes your conception because most people have this idea of a scientist as being somebody who spends their life going out, sticking instruments into things, manipulating objects in the laboratory. Okay? It's sort of the reading and the writing is a bit of an adjunct, in case you have to do it from time to time. And a lot of people like myself, for instance, went into science because we couldn't stand writing essays. Um, <laughs> okay. And you know, I diversely find myself now, all, most, most of the days, in front of the computer, trying to wrestle with language to communicate things. Uh, and it's tremendously important from that point of view. And I think what it does is it shows you a reflection of the value of the activity. Now, the question you've got to ask, I think which goes back to my earlier question, is why is this difficult for us as teachers of science to accept? Uh, and I do think that is a, an important question. Uh, I, I think part of it comes from actually thinking about what people engaged in communicating science see as the focus of their work. Uh, and I think very much, they see it very much about offering explanations about the material world. It's answers to questions like this, uh, which uh, are, are the things that we struggle with. It's interesting, actually, that this is not how the, the curriculum is framed, uh, or the textbooks are framed, in that sense. But nevertheless, I do think it's the, those kinds of areas. And when you look at it in that kind of way, you tend to think, well... Uh, you know, this is really what I'm concerned about. I want to go and experiment on the world, investigate the world, generate explanations, generate new knowledge. And again, somehow the language aspect of that gets dropped or forgotten or it doesn't seem to be central. Now, I think the way in which the converse position of that I think is illustrated for this, uh, by this Sidney Harris cartoon. Um, Sidney Harris always seems to crop up. He already had one of his cartoons uh, in the talk so far. Because he's a very perceptive man. Okay. Uh, and what he's pointing to here, okay, this is Kepler introducing uh, these new profound ideas about the orbits of planets, is the, how the act of communication depends upon the fact that the audience you are talking to okay, has a knowledge of the terms that you are using. That actually constructing meaning from sentences requires an appropriate background knowledge. Okay. In this case, What's an orbit, what's a planet, and what's elliptical? And if you don't have that, what you actually have to do as a teacher is to help people or give access to those words in the context in which they are used. And that what he's pointed to, really, is that actually constructing understanding, constructing meaning, is a constructive process. Okay? There is a simple view of reading that somehow either once you know the word, it's easy and I want to challenge that a little bit later on. What you're faced with is the fact that in science, what we're trying to do in students' minds all the time is construct entities. Okay? Things which are too large to see, they're just too enormous, galaxies and things like this. What we're also trying to do is construct entities that are too small to imagine, only accessible by instrumentation. So what you end up with is the challenge of describing to a pupil things like the following. Okay? How would you describe, for instance, an onion cell? Now, I think most of you know the answer to that kind of one. What you do is to say, well, you know, imagine it. Okay, when you look down the microscope, you're going to see something that looks like a row of bricks. Okay, looks like a row of bricks. Okay. Now, my first exercise to you okay, is to say, uh, how would you describe to a pupil those things? Okay, uh, an atom, a micron, what an electric current is. Okay. So with the person next to you, okay, okay, because this is where discussion is important, okay, just have a quick one, or a little, I'll give you a, you know, a minute of a chat about how you would describe them to somebody else. Then you're going to compare how you do it with how I do it. Okay? So if you have a, just a quick opportunity to do that. Okay, and I talk about inventing, because we're creating these entities uh, and the way in which we talk about them. Uh, and what you will have found is, I suspect, I mean, you've all been forced back on the fact that you've had to use words because you, even some of you might have started sketching things. Because, okay, what you try and do is you try and represent things, if you can, with words and pictures. 
This is the kind of standard picture that you can find of how we represent the atom. We say, look, you can imagine, it's like a little mini solar system, okay, and all these electrons are like the planets orbiting around. Look, it's the use of analogy and metaphor. We have to construct our picture, our representation of these things, out of things that we know. Okay? Because it's only in terms of things that we know that we will start to make meaning of it. The interesting thing about this one, which is something we could discuss at length, is why we continue with it in science education when quite clearly it's wrong. Okay? It is not the picture of the atom that uh, you will find with that scientists working with. And I think the answer is simply because it works. Okay? And there is an element to which we can make those kinds of compromises in science between what is the accurate scientific representation and ones which are comprehensible. Um, as for a microbe, uh, I found this one quite difficult, and the only way I could do it was to go looking on the internet, and that's the kind of picture I found of a fairly nasty-looking microbe. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, just imagine a nasty, small little germ. Okay, we generally associate them as being nasty, and I think that one kind of captured the notion of nasty, but I think it is quite difficult uh, in, in that sense. And that was the creative achievement of Pasteur, okay, to imagine that actually there were tiny living things that were causing the soup to go off, the bread to go off in that kind of way. And why on earth you dreamt it up, we, we don't know. Electric current, uh, uh, anybody who uh, teaches physics knows that you struggle with this one. The word current in some senses has embodied in it the notion of flow uh, uh, and something moving. So the word conveys a meaning in that kind of way. But you want a better representation of this. So there are various models around. Um, the one I quite like is the bicycle chain model. Uh, because basically it shows you uh, or it explains why electricity doesn't get used up. It's a kind of chain of things keep going round, and the pedal and the crank is what's put the battery is what's pushing it around and it transfers energy to the wheel at the back. Um, there's another one uh, which is used uh, which is this kind, they're called the joules and coulombs, okay, uh, or ca carriers, okay. The battery fills up the bags of the carriers, the coulombs, with joules they go around for the lamp where they get emptied, and then they go back. And there are as many people going out as they are going in. But all the time we are trying to build pictures, and build pictures with language. Uh, and this is, as teachers of science, the skilled teacher of science is a skilled user of the language, because they draw on this repertoire of pictures to help people, students construct this understanding. So, uh, uh, that's my first point, which is that uh, you can't engage in science without engaging in language. Imagine trying to explain anything without language. It would just be no science. 